this week specifically and, and next week, we're going to be focusing on, right, we're moving into a new class of mathematical um, problems that is also exceptionally commonly encountered in, uh, in the earth and environmental sciences, right? And um, that is uh, what is known as ad advection dominated problems. Okay, so advection is kind of uh, a weird word, and um, can, can everybody hear me, or do I need to break out the voice amplifier? Okay. Um, advection is a weird word, right? Um, it's often synonymous with convection, right? So if you've heard of convection stoves or convective heating, um, but it's not always interchangeable, and the reading in the book kind of makes some distinctions between different branches of the earth sciences that use the word convection in different, slightly different ways, right? Um, so for instance, in atmospheric sciences and meteorology, right, um, advection is something that appears in kind of the governing equations for mass and momentum flux, but convection is often associated with a specific type of, of heating and vertical motions in the atmosphere, right? So there are some subtle distinctions between that, whereas, you know, for instance, in, in river transport, for instance, um, advection and convection are used more synonymously. So what specifically is advection and... and, and um, Right, and how does it work? And so advection, just by way of definition, is transport of a quantity with the oops, uh, mean or net flow of a medium. Okay. All right, well, that's the that's a definition. What does that actually mean, right? So so one thing that I would put here is that this implies a degree of, of passive transport. And the best way I've ever heard of advection described, right, is, um, is if you think about this room, right, and we think about kind of the number of laptops or other computers, tablets that are in this room, and we think about the transport of tablets or computers from inside the room to outside of the room, the primary process through which that happens is, or maybe the only way that that would happen, is if one of you picked up your laptop and left the room, right? Or picked up a laptop. Hopefully you wouldn't steal your friends and colleagues' laptops, right? But advection is the process of, you know, that laptop or tablet being carried on the with the mean velocity of that person who's doing the transport, right? So you pick something up and you leave the room, you are advecting that thing that you're taking with you outside of the room, okay? So, yeah. So like the transport with Facilitated transport? Facilitated transport? Yeah, like proteins and... Um, yeah, so, okay, so the, the question for the recording, because it's a, a good one, right, is like, so facilitated transport, so would advection be, for instance, could you think of transport between a cell membrane, right, of a particular ion as being an advection process? And I think actually, yes, right, in that there's some mean flow of some substance like intercellular fluid, right, and along with that is coming some, some ions, right, through some channel, um, Right, so yes, you could think about um, uh, 
that, that's a form of, of advection, right? And in fact, um, you know, we often think about, uh, so numerical modeling of circulatory systems is often done with kind of computational fluid dynamics. Right, and often what we're interested in is the transport of specific kinds of things, right? Whether they're things like viruses or, um, you know, random, random tumor cells that are shutting off of primary tumors and the kind of metastatic process, or um, whether you're thinking of that in terms of therapeutics, right? Like how quickly is some medicine making it from where it's injected to where we want it to be? So, so yeah, so it's, it's those kinds of processes. Advection, as that example alludes to, is common in you know, many, many different uh, science and engineering fields outside of earth and environmental sciences, including things like HVAC, right? So um, transport of, uh, of pollutants or, or dust um, hazards through you know, uh, a venting of an HVAC system, right? That's, we think of that as being as an, an advective process. Okay, so um, what we're going to do, and again, we're going to introduce both kind of the dynamical equations as well as the numerical solution this week in the context of the actual problem that we're going to be solving, right? So in this case, by way of an example, so our example will be transport of a radioactive contaminant through a homogeneous aquifer. Okay. Um, this is kind of sadly a common environmental application faced by both earth scientists and engineers, right? The earth scientists trying to figure out what are the properties of the aquifer that it is flowing through, right? How quickly is, is this plume of contaminants being transported and, and our engineering friends more from the perspective of, well, can, you know, what uh, interventions can we design, build, and implement to kind of prevent that radioactive contaminant plume from becoming an actual hazard, right? Threatening drinking water supplies, ecosystems, and things of this nature, right? So, so um, let's start off with just a picture of this system. Um, and we're going to assume that the aquifer itself is, is fairly simple and homogeneous, right? So this is the bottom of our aquifer. We'll say that this is, an, um, this is what's known as an aquitard or an aquaclude. So aquitard, aquaclude. Okay. This is our surface, right? So up here, for instance, maybe we have some kind of, uh, um, this is the source of our contaminant. So maybe this is a old nuclear power plant, right? Draw the radioactive symbol. Um, and this aquifer has, let's say, a relatively uniform thickness. We'll call that H, right? We're going to assume that it extends kind of infinitely into and out of the screen or board, right? So we can do this on a per unit width basis, right? And let's say, for instance, here, right, we have something like a you know, something that we don't want contaminants in, right? So this might be something like a housing subdivision. This was the case uh, where I grew up at Rocky Flats. It's an interesting sort of case study if anybody's interested. Okay, and, and we're going to assume 
that there is a regional groundwater table. Okay, so down here there's a groundwater table. And we're, we're going to assume for the purposes of simplicity that it has a slope that is constant, right? So this is, oops. This is the, the thickness or the, uh, we'll call this the height of the water table here. This will have a constant slope. So D H, um, actually I'm gonna change my nomenclature here a little bit. I wanna call this H for simplicity and I'm gonna call this H sub A. So that's the thickness of the aquifer. So this D H um, and this should be a, a partial derivative just so this is dh, dx is a constant. Okay, and we will also presume that this aquifer has a known, because of our geoscience friends, has a known saturated hydraulic conductivity so we're going to say that this is known, this is homogeneous, and this is isotropic. Okay, so, and the, the distance between this, right, between our, our power plant here and our subdivision is some length L, okay? And, and for instance, right, we will, we're interested in this case in which this power plant is kind of leaking, putting it in kind of bright neon green here, this kind of radioactive stuff into the aquifer we're going to assume that this can dissolve, right? So this is the transport of, of some dissolved radionuclide in our aquifer, right? So this is kind of a visual depiction of our setup, okay? So there's a source of this contamination. There's um, some distance over which we're wanting to keep track of kind of what's happening in the aquifer. And there's some known properties of that aquifer, right? So for instance, we have obtained this saturated hydraulic conductivity through, you know, some geophysical surveys and looking at well logs. And we have some wells both near our contamination site, some intermediate location, and in our subdivision where we can measure the actual water table elevation. So that's how we know dh by dx is constant, okay? Okay. Any questions before we kind of move on with the setup here? Okay. So um, the thing that we care about, right, what we want to know is we want to know the velocity, we'll call this u, at which this stuff is advected, right? That seems like a pretty fundamentally important thing that's going to dictate how quickly this contaminant gets from the source to kind of where it might be a problem, right? So that velocity, is actually, that's what we get from the groundwater equations, right? So it turns out that this velocity, so the velocity, 
of water in the aquifer is dictated by Darcy's Law. Right? Which tells us that the flux, right? So this is often known as the Darcy flux. This is the Darcy flux. Is equal to, right? This is one of those. So we're introducing a diffusive process here, but in the end, what's going to happen is that it's going to give us a constant. So the, the Darcy flux is driven by, or is equal to, the product of the saturated hydraulic conductivity times the gradient of the water surface elevation, the water table, right? So this is the gradient of the potentiometric surface. Okay. So in our case, we, we know K sat, right? We've characterized that. This is a sufficiently kind of hazardous situation that we've received funding to measure K sat through a variety of means, taking, you know, cores of sediment and sending them off to labs, doing geophysical surveys. So we know that it's constant. We know that it's homogeneous. We know that it's isotropic, right? So we know KSAT, and at the same time, we've installed some wells in our system, both near the contamination site, near kind of where we're concerned about the impacts, and probably at some intermediate locations. So we know the value of this dh dx, and we know that it's constant, right? So it's a constant slope of a water surface elevation, okay? Okay, so if we know that, then our Darcy velocity u, which is also going to be our advection velocity, so this is both the Darcy flux and now our advection velocity That's equal to k sat, which is a constant, times dh dx, which is also a constant. And so that means that we have a constant velocity. So our advection velocity. is constant, okay? Yeah? How can we have a constant velocity in a saturated media? What was the last part of the question? We are in a saturated media because we are putting to the data. So this is just uh, to underscore for now, this is just the velocity of the water, right? So this would be the velocity of the water moving through the aquifer. 
even if we didn't have um, the radioactive substance dissolved within it, okay? This, and, and it's really, it, what, it comes, what it boils down to is that this dh dx being constant, right? So that, that physically would mean that you have like a large regional groundwater aquifer water table, right, that is relatively constant in slope. Right? And if that's the case, that difference in water surface elevation is driving flow from higher water surface elevation to lower water surface elevation, and the velocity of the flux is constant. So are we looking at the, um, the, um, the top water uh, level or the ground water level? Because even the surface may affect the rate of change of uh, this so this would be, this is beneath the surface, right? So this, you know, this is usually in lengths, like, so HA here would be in units of like, you know, like several kilometers in, in these types of systems. And then, you know, this would be like, you know, one or two kilometers worth of thickness. And the rate of velocity here is like very slow, right? So we're talking like millimeters per day, maybe order magnitude, so. Does that, does that, does that help? I mean, this, some of this is getting into some groundwater stuff. Um, you know, DH, DX is seldom constant, but for now we're just going to take it to be constant to make the math work easy. But yeah, you, this is kind of, this arrives is from kind of, um, yeah, Darcy's law, right? Uh, which, which gives, which is kind of this process of, a, a gradient driven flux similar to, you know, the sediment transport we dealt with last week and the, um, the heat flux that we did the previous couple weeks. Okay. Okay. Any other questions before? Okay. So that's the velocity at which the water is moving, right? Now we want to figure out right, what the, what the rate of mass transport is um, from, the, from the contaminant site through the aquifer, right? So we, we actually, I mean, we're concerned about the concentration, but we actually want to deal with the total mass of the substance that is dissolved in our aquifer, right? And so what is the mass, right? So the mass of the dissolved contaminant in a dx sized slice of the aquifer is, all right, so this would be the mass is equal to the concentration. So this is the concentration. And this would be in units of uh, mass of substance, usually per volume of water. Right, so this would have units, for example, of something like micrograms per liter, right? Something like that, parts per million. Okay, so the concentration. And so if the concentration is expressed as a mass of substance per volume of water, then to get the mass of the substance, we would just need to know what the volume of water is in this 
dx sized slice, right? So that would just be equal to the height of our aquifer or the height of our water table, right? So the height of the water column here. So that would be the height times dx. Right, and then this would be per unit width, right? So, you know, we could put in kind of the width of the aquifer here, but if we kind of assume that this aquifer sort of extends infinitely into the, um, into the, into or out of the iPad, then, you know, we're doing this on a per unit width basis, right? So this is the mass per unit width of the aquifer into and out of the page. Okay, so that's the, that's the mass, right? So now let's do the mass balance. So now let's examine the mass balance of the contaminant in that deact sized slice of aquifer, okay? So we'll draw a picture again here. And so we are interested in the change in storage that's actually, I'm gonna draw this over here. So this is dx in width, h in height, and we are interested in the mass balance of this slice of the aquifer, right? And so, if we describe our equation in words, this is going to be the change in mass, in contaminant mass, per unit time, right? And this is going to just be equal to what comes in, right? It's just going to be input minus output. All right, so again, what we're interested in is the D, so putting equations to this, putting a mathematical representation to this equation that we've written out in words, we're in interested in the time rate of change of the mass inside the system, which we just outlined up here, CH times DX, C times H times DX, and that's going to be equal to what comes in minus what goes out. Now, with an advective process, right, what comes in is just, uh, so if u is constant, it's just u times the concentration 
times h, oops, So this would be like u on the left side here. So I'm gonna, or the concentration on the left side here is gonna be C minus, and the concentration on the right here is gonna be C plus. So this would be C minus. What's that? Yeah. Okay. minus u times c plus times h. And we're interested in how this changes, right, over that distance delta x. Okay. All right, so a couple things to note here, right? There's a couple constants that we are, are dealing with. So u is a constant, right? So we can pull that out. h is a constant, we can pull that out, and it appears on this side as well. So these constants cancel, the h's cancel out. Actually, I did mess something up here, so, and this shouldn't be over, right? This is just the flux of mass coming in and the flux of mass going out, right? So the dx can come out because it's constant, so we can rewrite this as dx times dc dt, and that equals u times c on the left minus c on the right. And then we can multiply both sides by 1 over dx, right? And then this difference here just becomes a derivative, right? So if we multiply by 1 over dx, so multiplying or taking the spatial derivative of both sides, right, we get dx by dt is equal to u times, and just because we can get Right, this, I'm, I'm reverting here to the partial derivative notation just because, right, advection could be a three-dimensional process, but we're only concerned about one direction of advection here. So I'm going to use the partial derivative to denote that concentration could vary in x, y, and z, right, is just equal to the partial derivative of with respect to x, okay? Now often this is, this will be written in this way, dc dt minus u times partial c with respect to x is equal to zero, right? And that is the dynamic equation for advection, right? So this represents the, the rate of change or the rate of change of, of mass or concentration of some contaminant in the presence of a constant velocity, right, where that velocity is transporting that contaminant, right? So this contaminant's being passively transported in that velocity field, okay? Let's take a break there, and then we'll come back and apply a numerical solution to that, okay?
Okay. So the the interesting thing here, right, is that um, there's a spatial derivative here, right, um, and we we got used to those spatial derivatives, and in particular the second derivative in our diffusive problems. But it's interesting that a diffu that a advection process, right, one in which you wouldn't imagine the transport depending on the spatial gradient does, right? So that's kind of a, a wonky thing, and it's going to turn out to be that that's a pretty important thing that, that limits or makes our numerical solution kind of tricky, right, or hard. Um, and when I think about that, right, it, um, that's like saying that, right, if we have that mental model of advection being me picking up my iPad, having some constant velocity and leaving the room, right? We're kind of saying that, well, the, the total mass of iPads in this room actually depends on the gradient in I iPads with respect to the inside and the outside. So for me, at least, right, I kind of look at this equation, I'm like, you know, advection's weird, right? That it seems so simple and yet it winds up that there's a spatial derivative. Okay. So now we're going to go ahead and, and proceed with applying a numerical solution to this advection equation, right? And in particular, we'll, we'll focus on this equation up here, right? But again, we're going to think about this domain as being, right, a set of grid points on which we want to solve for that concentration with respect to time, And we are going to, again, denote space here, right? So this distance here would be delta x. This distance here would be delta time, right? This would be the jth point in space at the ith point in time. This would be the jth, j minus one point at the ith time and the j plus oneth location at time i. And we're interested in knowing right, we're interested in knowing, developing the machinery to be able to solve for the concentration at the jth point at the i plus oneth time, okay? So in this case, I wanna deal with the, the temporal derivative first, right? So I'm going to say that uh, we're going to just approximate this dc by dt is just going to become c at j at time i plus one minus C at J at time I over some delta T that you, the modeler, will choose. Okay. Okay, so that part is straightforward. So we've dealt with this part of the equation. Now we have to deal with this spatial derivative. And what I'm gonna do is just kind of skip to, right, if, if you recall what we did is for diffusion, right, we had to do a second derivative. So we kind of took the derivative, uh, you know, approximated the derivative at a half step kind of over here and then a half step over here, and then we computed the difference between them. And that's how we got that difference equation that looked like something like, you know, the, di you know, the, the, the value here minus two times the value here plus the value here over delta x squared, right? So in this case though, um, 
the choice in that spatial derivative is going to dictate whether or not our solution even converges. Okay, and it turns out that if we were to take, right, so if we were to, to say, well, let's just, let's just approximate dc by dx as c at j plus one time i plus one minus c, oops, sorry, this should be just time i, c at j minus one at time i, and this would be over two delta x, right? Because we would be going from here to here, right? So this would be a centered space difference approximation of that spatial gradient. It turns out that this is unconditionally unstable. Okay, well, that's, oops. That's kind of a bummer, and you'll see why in a second. Um, because that would have been con convenient, right? We could have balanced our spatial de derivative on the kind of ups, up, you know, upstream and downstream side of, you know, the concentration gradient. Okay, if, if, if our water is moving from left to right, okay? So um, one of the most popular and indeed the solution that, that, that appears in the example notebooks is what's known as an, you know, so this is, this is the centered space approximation. So this is centered space. Right? So the approximation we will have to take is what's known as an upwind difference. Okay, so the upwind difference will look like this, right? We will just approximate that concentration gradient as C at J minus 1 time i minus c at j at time i, and all of that over delta x, okay? Now, why is this called upwind? Yeah, we're we're going backwards, which which amounts to kind of going ag against the the mean flow velocity, right? So, in our picture here, and in all of the mathematical machinery since, we have made the assumption that u is from left to right, right? So our difference is going up upstream or upwind, right? A lot of this machinery got you know, kind of created either for wind tunnels or for, uh, you know, weather and atmospheric phenomena. So that's why this solution is called an upwind solution, okay? But, right, the key thing here that's kind of a pain is that, um, well, inherently our machinery assumes that the flow moves from left to right. Okay, um, as you all are aware, right, you could stand out for, stand outside for, you know, some period of time. Idahoans would say 10 minutes, so would Coloradans that, you know, wait 10 minutes and the weather would change, right? Um, in a lot of geophysical systems, flow direction actually changes direction, right? That's a common thing. The wind changes direction. If you're in an estuary, 
right, and the tide comes up, the flow direction in the estuary will change. Um, even in the Mississippi River, right, I don't know if, if some of you saw this, but I think it was during Hurricane Ida, one of the gauges of the Mississippi noted that, in fact, the flow direction of the entire Mississippi River was changing direction. So this is not uncommon for us as, as geophysical people, right, to have these systems where the flow velocity actually changes direction. Okay, So this is kind of a, a PETA, for lack of a better word. Okay, so all of this assumes that movement is from left to right. And we'll, I'll show you where this, where this comes up, okay? So if we put together this concentration gradient with our previous temporal derivative, right? So uh, putting these together, on the left side, we would have C at i plus 1, location j, minus c, location j, time i, over delta t. And that equals u over delta x times c, j, minus 1, time i, minus c location j time i and if we solve for c location j time i plus one then we get c time i plus one location j is equal to C location J time I plus U times delta T over delta X. Uh, I made that too big. delta t over delta x times c j minus 1 time i minus c j time i. Okay. All right. So this is an explicit solution, right? So we are solving for one time step ahead based on everything that we everything that happened at the previous time step, and it's also an upwind solution because we're taking the derivative in an upwind direction. Okay, so this is an explicit upwind approximation. Okay. So the last thing that we need to talk about is this quantity right here, right? So I will write this in big purple letters, U times delta T over delta X is known as the current number, okay? And if you look at, right, if you look at this, this is a velocity, which is like length per time times a time. So that would be a length divided by length. So this is non-dimensional. But what the current condition is telling us is the fraction of a spatial step traveled 
in one time step at the advection velocity. Okay, so the way that we can think about this current condition, right, is this, this idea that, okay, if we're moving along at the advection velocity and we're, we're going through a time step, right, the current number just represents basically how many of our kind of spatial steps or spatial locations we travel in an individual time step delta t, okay? So, um, the, it, we're gonna keep track of, and we need to be mindful of what this current number or current condition is, okay? Because, um, so the value of the current condition say current number is exceptionally important in terms of stability and accuracy. Generally, generally, we want the current number to be close to one. Okay. All right, so we want the current number to be close to one, right? So based on the velocity, a way to do this, for instance, would be to say, okay, we're going to pick our spatial step, right? Based on convenience, right? Based on how finally we want our concentration profile to be resolved. So we're going to choose our spatial step. We know the velocity. We're going to set the current number equal to one and back solve for our time step, right? So we'll solve for a time step that leads to a current number of one so that we get a stable solution, okay? So, and it's not, it's not as though getting a current number away from one necessarily leads to a, an, an unstable solution. But as you'll see on Thursday, and a thing that is really weird about numerical solution to advection problems is that, um, and let me write this down here. So um, a solution to the advection problem where the current number departs from one can look like, all right, so if this is C, concentration, and this is X, right? So if we have some initial mass, right, so our, this is our initial mass of contaminant, 
right? What we can get is something that looks like this, right? So at, at one time step, we have something that looks like this, right? And then at a next, at a, a next time step, we get something that looks like this. And then at some subsequent time step, we get something that looks like this. Okay. So initially, what started off as this kind of um, what we what we talk about in mathematics language is looking like a delta function, right? So a infinitesimally thin, you know, deposit of concentration at the origin is as it moves through our aquifer, not only is it being advected along, but it's being stretched out, right? And what does this, what does, what is this process called as, you know, the plume would tend to widen and decrease in its magnitude? And I'll give you a hint, we just spent four weeks covering it, right? Yeah, this looks like diffusion, right? Our, our, our initial thing looks like it's being smoothed as it moves out in time. And that's weird because that shouldn't be what advection looks like. What advection looks like, again, is somebody picking up that contaminant plume and moving it along with the velocity. So this is what's known as numerical diffusion. And it is not real, right? So, so we keep track of the current condition the current number, because the, the more it departs from that value of one, the more we're introducing this kind of anomalous or numerical diffusion into our problem, which is not real. We're adding a, a, a physical phenomenon that we did not intend to inject into the model, right? It's not as if advection and diffusion can't happen simultaneously, and in fact, Two weeks from now, that's the module that we're going to discuss is advection dispersion, which is both diffusion and advection. But in this particular case, this is not what we were intending to start off with. Okay, so if we, if we don't keep close tabs on what that current number is, and the, the assignment for this, for this module, right, will be kind of looking, examining what happens with numerical diffusion, we can introduce a process that shouldn't be there, okay? Now, a final comment. So that's, that sounds good in principle, right? Is that, oh, well, that's simple. We just choose delta T and delta X such that, you know, the product of U and delta T divided by X, delta X is, is one. But what's another big problem with our geophysical flows? Is U constant? I think it depends on the size of U. On the size of what? On the size of U. The size of U? Yeah. Even if it's constant, but its size? Yeah, so that's one thing, right? Is if U is really big, right? Um, if you take a look at this, if you want to finally resolve, right, if you have a really fast system, like high Mach numbers for one, right, U is really big. If you want to solve for what, you know, heat is doing over the wing of an aircraft, and you need to know that in centimeter resolution, delta T has to be really small, right, because things are moving really fast. So that's one problem. But in our geophysical problems, right, whether it's the weather, right, if this is the wind speed, whether this is uh, the speed of the velocity of the water in a river, U is seldom constant, either in space or in time, right? So in this system, it's, it's 
likely, right, if you're talking about a river, it's likely that U is changing, speeding up and slowing down, both in your domain as well as through time, right? So U is, is frequently not common. Okay, so what, what seems like it might be a strategy of dealing with that? So I think we, um, because it's going to be decreasing and increasing, so we pick the maximum, and then we give that, that will take in the decreasing and... Yeah, so, you know, one strategy would be just to choose a time step where you're, you know, you're doing no harm, right? Like, you're not going to introduce numerical diffusion... <laughs> Um, in your, you know, in, in what's dictated by the largest velocity, for instance, right? You choose the smallest time step. The downside of that, of course, is that, like, you're probably, there's more computation there than you need to be using. One strategy that's commonly used, right, is this idea of dynamic time stepping, right? Is changing your time step based on the flow velocity in your actual system. Right, so you have some if statements in your model right, that say, hey, check my current number. If it's bigger than one, then reduce delta t until the current number is about one or maybe slightly smaller than one. Right, similarly, right, if my current number is like less than 0.05 or something, I can increase my delta t. Right, so there is this notion of adaptive time steps, right? Making sure that the time steps adapt to the dynamics of the system. And that's a commonly done thing in numerical models, right? So in a lot of the models that we use of advective systems, so things like HEC-RAS, right? Um, the weather research and forecasting model, um, a variety of these problems, we have this situation in which the model will sort of adaptively check on the time steps or the current number and adjust the time steps accordingly. Okay? All right. That is it for today. I will see you all on Thursday.